Alien Intruder is a 1993 film written by Nick Stone and directed by Ricardo Jacques Gale. It's also more than likely the only time you will ever hear those names, as this is seemingly their most well-known production. That isn't saying much. And the only reason it's even available as it is in the UK is that it was quite often bundled together with two dozen other films as part of a promotion in the early days of DVD in order to shift more players. Even saying this is their most well-known production, I'd be stretching it because that would imply that anyone would remember this absolutely forgettable film that quite honestly tested my patience right the way through its 90 minute runtime. The plot of this film is that a spaceship captain from the year 2022, played by Star Wars veteran Billy D. Williams, is asked to attempt a rescue mission of a stranded spacecraft, and so he recruits four prisoners with varying special skills. An engineer, a computer whiz, a demolitions expert, and a general all-rounder to join Williams on his mission. As payment, they're promised their freedom on their return, and every weekend they get to spend time in a VR chamber that will let them live out their ideal scenarios, which mainly involves screwing around with any woman they can think of. It's implied at the beginning of the film that some kind of female ghost hallucination may be responsible for causing the stranded vessel's crew to go on a rampant killing spree, and as the plot trundles along we find out that the captain may have ulterior motives for accepting this rescue mission, and that all is not as it would seem with the virtual reality pods. From the very beginning, right the way through to the end, this film absolutely screams cheap, with large chunks of the film based either in one long corridor filmed from multiple angles with a different coloured gel on the lights, or in a packed warehouse that's closed for the night, doubling up as a spaceship. Which wouldn't be so bad if it wasn't for the fact that you can see the factory's corrugated iron roof in some shots. When they aren't filming there, all the other scenes are mostly shot as close up as possible and often in complete darkness so as to hide the fact that they couldn't afford to dress the sets properly. It's a thrifty technique but has the one flaw of being absolutely glaringly obvious that they couldn't afford to dress the sets. And they do this so much that it verges on taking the piss to say the least. It also doesn't help that the special effects both computer generated and practical range from quite poor to awful, with several spaceship shots that wouldn't look out of place in early MST3K episodes. Which would be fine if they used the same shadowy techniques they'd used to hide the sets, but these shots are lit up as bright and clearly as they possibly can be, utterly ruining any illusion they may have. Compounding this issue is the sheer amount of padding this film has. Realistically, this film has 45 minutes of semi-decent plot. Even with liberal trimming, it still wouldn't be a good film. But for the early 90s, you could probably get a more than reasonable extended TV special out of this. The remaining 45 minutes, however, left me audibly groaning. In particular, they focus on each of the prisoners' VR sequences, and while watching, I found myself going, Oh, a Western fantasy. Well, this is bland. To Jesus. I thought the western was bad. The noir scenes are interminable. To Jesus, I thought the noir was bad. The happy day scenario is awful. And it's full of plot holes and continuity errors. To Jesus, they've actually given up on scenarios at this point. It's literally just a bloke working out and drinking water in every shot with the odd bit of gratuitous nudity. And this goes on for absolutely ages. We don't just do the rounds on these VR moments once. We do them twice and these absolutely stuff the film up pacing-wise. I'm up for titillation as much as the next man, but don't hide your eroticism behind a thinly veiled plot exchange. Come up with a good reason for boobs and you can have boobs, otherwise it's just sleazy. The acting in this film is all over the place, with about 70% of the cast absolutely not arsed about being there, and Billy D. Williams in particular spends a good chunk of this film barely even beginning to emote. 
Then again, I don't think I could muster up the efforts for a film like this. And the remaining 30% being absolutely over-the-top Ham City, with Jeff Conway's foreman being well and truly off with the fairies and arguably the best part about this film. Every scene he's in is captivating. It's almost as if we're seeing an actual mental breakdown of just how aggressive and dry he is throughout this film. Tracy Scoggins also gives quite a good performance in places as the malicious Ariel, though her performance does start to wander into Elvira territory towards the end. Acting is only half of it though. The script absolutely makes sure this film fails to meet any standard. With clunky, stinted dialogue that's way too underdeveloped and half-baked, they're written in such a way that realistically there was only two ways this could ever be delivered. Desperately downplayed or absolutely scene-chewing OTT which absolutely kills any kind of atmosphere this film could have had. It really struggles to find what it wants to be. Half of this film is treated like your standard science fiction space adventure type film, but the other half is treated like aliens. And the two styles really just don't blend together. It's very off kilter. Peter. coffee too much for you? Your children. You know I live for caffeine. Your children! God damn it, your children! <sighs> you need to try some decaf, Peter. Oh, shit. The direction is in the grey zone. Not fundamentally bad, but not good either. There almost doesn't seem to be any life in this production from that aspect. And the cinematography follows suit, having a couple of good moments but ultimately just being too safe and bland, offering nothing new. In fact, it comes across in many ways as less developed than some of the films that are 30 years its senior. The soundtrack could not scream music library any harder if it tried. In the time that it's taken between watching the film and recording this, which was less than 12 hours, I honestly couldn't hum you one composition from what was in this film. It was all incredibly forgettable. The sound effects are all stock sounds too, including a couple of pieces that are just generic 80s laser gun sound effects that you can find in any kid's toy gun from the 80s and 90s, cheap, tinny and thin on the ground. This film's biggest crime is that for quite a few scenes, it's just really boring. There was a fight scene towards the end of the film and they failed so hard to make it in any way interesting. My eyes just glazed over and I started to think of what I was going to have for my tea or what was going to make it into this review and what would be cut. In an odd twist, that same fight scene had other cast members in who were just quietly talking to themselves and discussing things, just letting them get on with fighting each other as if nothing was happening. It just takes me back to how much padding there is in order to just push this film over the 90 minute mark. It's absolutely shameless. Alien Intruder was released as part of a two disc set of four films in 2003 by Prism Leisure. This is probably the best it will ever look and it looks poor here. It's presented in 4.3 and it really is just lacking any kind of reason to pick it up. I suppose the best reason to get it is that there are three other films included on this set that may or may not be better than this one. The film isn't good bad by any stretch of the imagination. It's bad in a has to be seen to be believed kind of way. And that's a real shame because it means I'm going to have to keep this film for reference. The sheer number of basic plot errors, plot holes, continuity errors, poor scripting choices, coupled with poor direction, cinematography, scattergun acting and repetitive generic padding absolutely removes any requirement to go and see this film. Short of the sadistic need to double check what I'm saying is true, it has a few funny silly moments, but honestly, it's really not worth your time. <laughs>